God wants us to go through the fire. And when we go through the fire, also not smell like smoke. What does that mean? That means that God wants to use all the hurt, all the things that was meant to destroy you or hurt your heart or offend your heart. And He wants to turn those things around to build character in you. If you are ready, you can switch on your Bible or you can open up your Bible. And um, <clears throat> I would like to share a couple of things. I hope you charged your Bible for the newer generation, those who use an iPad, an iPhone, or a Samsung. Um, I want to read a short scripture a little bit later this morning. But be before we start, um, as always, it's a huge privilege to be here. I absolutely love Pastor Bruce and Anya, his wife. Um, they're two wonderful, wonderful people. Um, and we've had the privilege to have them with us in Middleburg as well to come and visit. I'm the pastor of uh, Cornerstone Church, Middleburg. For those who have never heard me preach, um, we've never come to one of our services, of my services. Um, and we have a wonderful church in Middleburg. Uh, amen. We have uh, quite a couple of people always getting together, doing something for the Lord. Uh, I'm married to a beautiful wife, Ahisha, Pastor Ahisha. Usually people ask me, um, or when they hear our names, they think we're Indian. Pastor, Pastor Yamon and Ahisha Snaiman. Ahisha is actually um, one of the books in the Quran, if, if you don't know. You, you, you might know. But um, we have a lot of people in our church from, uh, from everywhere, to be honest. We have Chinese people in our church, um, every race, every color. And, and every now and again, they tell me, listen, can we make you something to eat? For some reason, they think I'm always hungry. I don't know why. But everybody in the church always asks me, can we make you something on a Sunday? You know, and so Briani is absolutely brilliant. That's, I, I love it. We have a lot of Indian people in our church. We have Chinese people in our church. Hopefully I'll get sushi soon. I believe I will. But um, we've been in ministry quite, quite some time now. I realize that I've been in ministry 20 years this year. 20 years. I'm not that old. You know, I just started young. I started when I was 19 years old. I started preaching, um, and I absolutely love doing it. I love the church, and um, I promise you I had a more formal shirt for today, but I didn't know that my body can change that much in two weeks, <laughs> especially if you don't go to the gym anymore and if you have a Burger King in, in, in your town. Um, my, I really, I put that shirt on today. It didn't fit, so I had to wear this one. So, I'm so I usually dress a li little bit more formal, um, but this is how I am today, casual Sunday today. Amen? Resurrected Sunday today, so hopefully my gym membership gets resurrected, and, and my desire, desire to, to do something with my body <laughs> comes back, but for now I just had to survive a little, the last couple of weeks, but yeah, <laughs> faster metabolism, or Burger King to close down in Middleburg, that's, that's the other thing that can happen. But, yo, we are really blessed in Middleburg. There's so many things happening at the moment, and um, it's, there's so many plans that the Lord has, you know. And um, strange enough, this year, I feel the Lord is really doing something new. And I saw that on the screen a while ago as well, where it says, be ready for the new thing, you know. And I really believe that God is always doing a new thing, <laughs> always. Sometimes we think he's, he's, he's doing something again that he did. Many times we pray, Lord, you can do it again. I don't always think he wants to do it again. I think he wants to do something new. I, I, don't, I don't always think God wants to heal your body. He wants to give you a new body. It's all about doing something new. I mean, sometimes we pray, Lord, please heal my heart again. Let my heart be what my heart was like five years ago. God says, I don't want to give you that heart again. I want to give you a brand new one. I don't care how old you are or where you are. I want to give you something brand new. So I believe that God always does something new. And wherever Jesus steps into a room, there's life. There's healing, there's happiness, amen? So smile at somebody next to you. You're at Resurrection Sunday, not the funeral Sunday, not the Sunday Jesus didn't get up Sunday. Jesus got up, amen? And he got out of the grave. So, yeah, smile at somebody. Give somebody a Resurrection Sunday smile. Tell them we are happy, we are celebrating. So uh, if you are here for the first time, you're at a good church, amen? Amen? Let's give this church a hand. You guys are doing really well. Um, so I'm happy to be here. And my wife wanted to come with so badly, but she had to stay at home, look at everything there in the service. We also have a guest preacher at our church. And um, we have four children. We have four children. 
we have four kids. So we have, <laughs> so we have two girls and two boys. They are absolutely uh, wonderful. They love the Lord. They are church-going kids. They just want to go to church every single day. You must see them pray for the sick. You must hear what dreams they are dreaming. And, and that, that is the greatest gift for us, amen, is to see that every day and to be able to invest in our children. So I thank the Lord for that. Um, we are really a happy family, enjoying the Lord. We love church, and we keep our eyes on the bigger picture. And I think that's very important. I think it's so important. And I'm gonna, I want to speak about that a little bit today, about the bigger picture. You know, um, I, have, I had so many things that I was ready to preach last night and even this morning but as I came into the building, I just felt a couple of things in my heart, and I just want to speak to you about that today. Is that okay with you? Like my shirt today, casual? I'm going to be casual today. Is that okay? There's just certain things you can do in other churches we can't do in your church. And there's certain things I, I can say today that Pastor Bruce can't say to you. So <laughs> that's the wonderful thing about swapping out every now and again. You know, so um, I'm really glad to be here. But before we start, I want to pray with you this morning. And before we pray, just put your hand on your heart, just real quick. Put your hand on your heart. I want to pray for your heart. Lord, I want to thank you that today we can sit here in this building. Lord, many of us came with an expectation. Many of us came because someone invited us. Many of us came because we wanted to go somewhere on a Sunday where we could be in the midst of other people celebrating your resurrection. But Lord, I want to thank you that each person is here today that had to be here. And I thank you, Lord, even for those watching via live stream, I pray, Lord, that you will come and do something brand new in every person's heart sitting in this building today and listening to this sermon. Lord, I pray that you will help me translate what you've shown me into physical words that everyone can understand it and that everybody can leave this building with clarity, with eyes on the bigger picture, and a healed heart today. Not just a healed heart, but a brand new heart. Lord, I want to pray that it will be a resurrection today, not just in our own lives, for our own visions, our own goals, but Lord, your plans, Lord, your vision, Lord, your will. And that's my prayer, and that's where I'm stuck at this morning, is where Jesus knelt down in the garden of Gethsemane, sweating blood where he said, Lord, Father, thy will be done, not my will. Thy will be done. So, Lord, I pray today, thy will be done in every person's life here this morning. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So, are you ready? So, first of all, I mentioned a couple of sentences back. I said, there's certain things we can say in our own churches as pastors that we can't really say in other churches. And then we can say in churches what we can't always say in our own churches. And so the Lord uses us to be shepherds of people, shepherds of people. But a while ago, the Lord spoke to me and said that I didn't just call you to be a shepherd of people. I called you to be a protector of their hearts as well. So I think the big thing for us as pastors is to do what the Lord wants us to do. Even if it offends, even if it troubles, we have to be obedient to what God tells us as pastors. We have to. We have to say, Lord, this is what I want to say. This is how I want to do it. And God says, no, no, no. This is how you're going to do it. And you know, a couple of weeks ago, I had one of those services like I said, you can't say a couple of things in other churches, but you can't say in your church. But I had a, couple of, I had a service a couple of weeks ago where I, I called that sermon brutally honest. I was brutally honest with my church. I spoke to all of them about the bigger picture. And I didn't, I believe I didn't offend anyone or make anyone upset or hurt anyone. But I was just honest. Sometimes you have to say, let's all speak about the white elephant in the room. I think that's one of the biggest problems that we sit with today. When we came out of lockdown, everybody, everybody, in, in some or other way, if you're an introvert or an extrovert, it, it doesn't matter. 
somehow we've all drawn back to protect what we can protect, to protect what we can lay our hands on, and we have somehow isolated ourselves. We've been isolated physically, but I think um, spiritually, we've been isolated emotionally, we've also been isolated. During lockdown, uh, one of my good friends, a very well-known businessman, spoke to me and he said, Yamon, you won't see a change in the church in the next year, even in lockdown. Even churches may grow in lockdown. He said, but wait for after two years. After two years, after men, and not just women, but he said men, businessmen, CEOs, CFOs, directors, managers, after lockdown have hit them, you will only see the effect of lockdown on their lives two years later. And he went prophesying. He just said, that is statistics. It is proven. And what I saw in my church two years after lockdown, I saw that happening. During lockdown, are you okay? I'm good. A year later, I'm okay. Two years later, I saw things happen to men that I never expected to happen with. I saw them do things that I never thought they'd do. They started acting out in a way, not knowing, not knowing how to perform, not knowing what decisions to make or what to do or, what to dis, um, you know, or how to treat people or how to manage their company. Somehow, the, some of them just gave up. Brilliant, big business, successful businessmen. Nothing went wrong. They just couldn't cope anymore. It was as if that trauma just hit them two years later. And I realized that it's so important that... We should not get isolated. You should not withdraw. And a while ago, I was preaching to our church, and I said to them, guys, that is how the enemy works. The enemy is, uh, strategy is like a pack of wolves. A pack of wolves will run behind the sheep for a couple of kilometers until one of them gets tired. One of the sheep gets tired. And the one get, that gets tired gets isolated, and then the wolves attack that one. They focus on the one that gets separated from the flock. So we should understand that our strength as Christians is in our unity. It is with us working together, sticking together. That is what's important with us as Christians. Satan gets hold of people. And um, the, the reason why I said good businessmen is that you would never think that they would get isolated. But all of us or many of us always think our situation is unique and therefore we isolate ourselves. The first step of devastation is isolation. Then comes separation. But usually isolation, you can write this down, usually isolation starts with frustration. Unattended frustration. As any oplet, no frustration. I want you to write this down if you can. Write it on somebody's hand or arm or, or on your tablet if you have it. Otherwise, you can, you can recap on the sermon and you can write it down. But I want to say, if you don't look at the frustration in your life, it will cause isolation. If you don't handle the frustration, it will cause isolation. When you isolate yourself... Isolation brings devastation. So frustration, isolation, devastation. That is how the enemy works. An open door for the enemy to hurt you, to harm you, is, for, is to isolate you. That is always how he works. And so even in, in, in lockdown, it was difficult for us as preachers to preach to a, a screen of a phone or a TV or a camera the whole time. Because we wanted to get to our people. We wanted to speak to everyone. And I don't want to speak about, uh, you know, lockdown or all. I don't want to talk about that today. What I want to talk about today is your heart. What did you do with your heart? And I realized that, that through these years, the Lord had to work a lot with me as well. He had to work a lot with me. And not necessarily to teach me something to understand it better or to think different. He had to work with my heart. There's a scripture in Job, in the 40s, in, the, in, 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 in that passage, that area, Job says one thing. He says, for my eyes have seen, oh, no, sorry, my ears have heard, but now my eyes have seen. 
it took him more than 40 chapters to get to the point where he can say, I heard this in the beginning, but it took me 40 chapters to get where I am now, and now I see. So he went through trials. He went through temptations. He, he isolated himself at a time. Then his friends came, and then they tried to give him advice. They tried to speak to him, and he still couldn't see, couldn't, couldn't see, couldn't see. He heard everything the whole time, but it took him 40 chapters until he got to the point where he said, I've heard, but, and now I see. See, sometimes we, it takes us a long time to, we always hear, we hear, we hear. We come to church every Sunday, we hear. Our friends tell us, we hear, we hear, we hear. But and we have to see it, to understand that. That is called the revelation. I hear and I see. I don't just hear. Are you all with me? And usually, but, but, uh, in between the hearing and the seeing lies your heart. Your heart lies in the middle. From hearing, from where you are hearing until you get to seeing, it, that needs to go through your heart first because your heart is a transistor or a transformer that transforms what you hear to the point to where you see it. And I thought about this a lot today because the Lord had to work in my heart because at a time I isolated myself because we do it unknowingly thinking that we are protecting ourselves when we isolate ourselves. You are not protecting yourself you are making yourself vulnerable. Let me say it again. We think we're protecting ourselves. You're not. If you isolate yourself, if you withdraw from the company, the Bible says in the midst of um, a, a, a company, there is wisdom. There is wisdom. And why is it important to be in the midst of other people? Because they can see what you can't. And at a time, I would go in gym, okay? So I played rugby for a long time. I had to stop. I broke my arm. So I started playing golf. Amen. Did I get an amen there at the back? Are we playing golf tomorrow? I can stay a day longer. Um, <clears throat> I started playing golf. So my, then my daughter was born. And then I realized golf days ain't going to work that good anymore because I can rather make it Inga days. So I put my bags away. I made it an Inga day. So I'll spend time with my daughter those days. So uh, starting again, by the way. So next time I come, I'll bring my clubs with. So I'm trying to resurrect my, my golf thing as well. I lost it somewhere. It died somewhere a couple of years ago. <clears throat> and so I started gymming again, started working out. But I didn't invite any friends. I didn't join anyone. I didn't ask anyone to come with. I went to go and gym myself. And so it is with life. With life, you can't start heavy immediately. Um, God never starts big. God always starts small. God always starts with a seed, and then he creates a tree, and then there's fruit. That's always how God works. God, God starts small with everything. Church, small. Your own life, small. Your relationship with him, small. Milk, and then meat. Are you all with me? God has a strategy of how he does things. And so I started to, and, and, and with Jim, it works the same way. You can't put all the weights on and then think the first day of gym, you're going to gym and you're going to push that weight and you're going to get big the next day, okay? It doesn't work that way. If you want to gym, if you want to get fit, you don't run the comrades the first day. Am I right? Any amens? You will die, most probably, <laughs> if you do that. I, I know I will die, by the way. I will. If I have to go and run the comrades right now. I will not finish. The only way I will get over the finish line is in an ambulance. That's the only way. So, but if I practice today and practice for the whole rest of the year, maybe at the end of the year. So with God, it always works that way in relationships, in restoring your heart. But there is always a start to something. And that's usually the biggest decision that you have to make. And sometimes the Lord needs to come and give you a bit of a head start to change your heart. Maybe he needs to give you a bit of a reality check. For you to look at it and say, my heart is not in the right place. I need to change my heart. I had a couple of reality checks in the last couple of weeks for those who know me personally. Donato is laughing because he knows what I've been through lately. But I had a couple of reality checks where I had to sit and really reevaluate my life. And that's why I said in the beginning, it's by grace that I'm here today. Great grace. But the awesome thing is, is that God is able to do it. 
a while ago, we looked at a friend of mine. I said to him, God doesn't want to give you a, a restore your heart. He wants to give you a brand new one. He said, really? Can he do it? I said, let's see. I prayed for him. That man's life is completely different <laughs> than it was a couple of weeks ago. I can't even start to explain to you how the Lord changed his life because he made the decision. And usually that is how it works. Every year we start the year off, I'm going to gym this year. And you get through the whole year and they did you go to gym? You didn't even get a gym membership. But it starts with a decision you have to make. It's a decision. And you know what I saw today? I'm going to jump ahead. You know what I saw today? I saw a man in a vision. I saw a man lying dead on a, on a bed. And I saw them with the, uh, what, what, what do they call those? Those two machines? A fibrillator. I s- yeah, uh, what? That's a shock. <laughs> That's the best one that I've had before. So, and, and they brought, and I saw somebody put that on the man's chest, and boom. And his heart didn't beat. And they checked on the screen. And I saw this in a vision this morning, and I didn't know why. And again, I saw them bring the fibrillator, and they put it on his chest, and shocking him. And the next moment, beep, and I saw a heart be going. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, I want to shock a couple of people this morning to get their hearts beating again. And I'm jumping ahead of time. I usually don't do it. But that's a vision that I saw. And I said, but Lord, how can we do this? And the Lord said, what happened to you a couple of weeks ago? I said, Lord, my heart's been working good <laughs> for the last year, for the last couple of years. I'm doing good. And the Lord said, no, no, no. There was a bit of a shock. And Satan wanted to use that shock to kill you. But I used it to, brought, to bring new life into your heart. And the Sunday before the incident that happened to me, that Sunday was my brutally honest, honest Sunday with the church. And I spoke to them about not getting separated, not getting isolated. I know you're going through something. I'm also going through something. I know your marriage might be difficult at the moment. You're facing troubles in your marriage. I also face troubles in my marriage every now and again. But you know what? I am here. Do you know why? Because of Jesus. Because of the Lord. I don't love my wife just because I feel like it, or just because I really love her. I love her because it is a service that I give unto God. I love my church because it's a service that I give unto God. I don't go to church on a Sunday because I like the pastor. I go to church on a Sunday because I love him. Um, if, if you get offended, and I said it a couple of times, said if I've offended you, I'm sorry. If someone have offended you in church or hurt you in church, I'm sorry, but your focus was wrong. It's your fault. You have to change your focus. Bishop spoke to me a while ago. He laughed. He said, Jamon, do you know that I fired my church twice? I said, what, Bishop? He said, I've fired my church twice. I said, what? I've never heard of anyone who's ever done that. He said, Jamon, we started our church in a shop front building with 30 chairs. You would switch on the lights of our church with one switch. All the lights. He said, that's how we started. My heart's always been right. And then when we were a thousand people in the church, and it was as if everybody came to a funeral, I got onto the stage. I asked the church, did you enjoy the worship? Some of them said yes. Some said, no. I said, okay. And, and he said, I've been preaching for a while now, and none of you say amen or yes. You're leaving me all alone here in front. You're not involved. You're not committed. I'm sorry. If you want to come back to church, come back next Sunday, but the service is closed. You can go. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> you know, that, those refibrillators. Boom. Sometimes you need to wake up a bit because we can get so caught up in our own little lives. Please understand me correctly today. I don't want to offend anyone, but I want to shock you a little. We get so caught up in our own little situation, our own problems, our own marriage problems. We get caught up in our own family problems. We get caught up in our own church problems, our own Kimberly problems. I know one of them's water. We can help you with that. We get caught up in our own problems. We get so caught up that we forget about a dying world on the outside. We get so caught up in our own personal situations and insecurities that there are people lying on deathbeds in the hospital while we are complaining and moaning, um, not knowing what they're going through. Everybody's going through something. 
Everybody is facing something, but we get so caught up in our own little things that God, I think sometimes that God sits back and thinks, oh my goodness, I know what you're going through is hard. I'm going to help you through it. I'm going to help you through it, and I'm going to protect your heart through it. But there are a lot of people going through much worse than you. Maybe if you start focusing on that, you're going to forget about your small problem. And I hear about people leaving church lately. My friends in ministry, other pastors all over the world saying, oh, you know what, that, that friend that has been with me in church, for, for he started the church with me, he, he just left. And, and, and I asked him, why did he leave? I know him, why did he leave? He said, no, he didn't like that one song we sang. I want to take those. <laughs> Maybe he needs to get resurrected a little. Maybe he needs to get shocked a little. A reality check, a little. And I thought, that's not what church is about. That's not what church is about. That is not what is serving God is about. Um, that's not the relationship with the Lord. You know, and, and, I, and many times I've heard people say, you know, it's not you, Pastor. The Lord is taking us into something new. And we prayed about it. And the Lord said, we have to leave the church. And I'm like, did the Lord that loves me so much, tell you to leave my church at the shooting. <laughs> so I got offended. I'm, I'm offended. And I've heard people say, um, you do you, me do me. What you, don't, what you don't know is you doing you is offending me. And so I couldn't understand. I said, so did, did the Lord tell you to do that? He didn't tell me that. Did the Lord tell you to do that? And people don't always understand by what we say, we can really hurt each other. And I stood there that Sunday, on Brutally Honest Sunday, I stood there and looked at everybody and I said, it's so easy for people just to say that. We're in a new season, or we are this, or we are that, and we prayed about it, and this. And I said, well, if I've ever done something, please tell me. I want to know. I want to know. But what you don't know is that, that, that I've been praying for your marriage because I see it's falling apart. I've been praying for months for your marriage, every day. What you don't know is I've been praying for your children for weeks now. When I see them, I lay my hands on them. You don't see it, but I do it. And I just sit and say, no, we, oh, you know, we're not going to be anymore. We're going to go to, the, or we're going to do this. We're not going to stay away from church for a while. And I think, that's the first mistake you're going to make. And they don't know how I've been praying for their kids, praying for them, praying for their business, phoning people to support their business. They don't know all of that, but I've been doing it for months. And then look at you and just say, no, we're, it's, and it's hard. But that's the moment when you have to protect your heart. Say, Lord, it's not about this, not about that. I didn't do it for them. I did it for you. It's about you. It's about the bigger picture. And sometimes a reality check opens up your eyes to see things different. And that's where Job said, I've heard it, but now my eyes have seen. You have to get to that place where offense doesn't hurt you anymore. Offense doesn't offend you anymore. Where you keep on loving people. I have people, I have a very good friend of mine in my church who left our church because he went, he lost his baby. His wife was pregnant and he started the church with me, another man. And he went for such a hard time because he lost his child. And the day he was crying, saying, well, I don't know when I'm going to come back again, but I have to work through this. I'll see you again. You know what? It's five years now. He haven't come back again. I still see him watch certain services. And the Lord spoke to me and said, reach out to him. Reach out to him. He needs someone. I said, Lord, but he withdrew. He said, no, no, you go after him. I phoned him. I said, I don't want him to come to church. He said, what? I said, listen, I'm going to tell you. You don't have to come to church to be my friend. I'm still your friend. I know you're going through something, but I want to go with you through it. I want to go through it with you. And I opened up a business opportunity for him. He couldn't believe it. He thought, why are you helping me? Why are you doing this? And the Lord restored his life. The Lord restored his relationship. We speak every week. We are great friends again. Even if he's not part of my church at the moment, I see him watching. You know, that's the awesome thing about Facebook. I see him watching every now and again. <laughs> but you know what? He phoned me a while ago crying over the phone. It's about relationship. And we can get so caught up, we can get so offended so easily that we miss the big picture. And then we get isolated. And sometimes it happens because of frustration. But frustration needs to be dealt with. Okay? I've looked at the people and said, if I've ever done something wrong, will you please come and tell me? 
that's what I'm like. If we go to a restaurant, and if you decide to eat steak and spinach, bless your heart. <laughs> Amen, I'm not joking. Great. But if we have a conversation, and if we are going to be there for about an hour, and if there's a piece of spinach right here, in between your teeth, you need to know I'm going to be the first guy to tell you. And that's why it's important to have people around you because so they can sometimes see what you cannot see. That's why there's wisdom in a company of people. And I said that in a church, if you are upset because of the children's church or maybe that person did something, don't isolate yourself. Don't stay away. Come and tell us. If there's a piece of spinach in my teeth when I'm preaching the Natu, anything there? Tell me. Because you know what? The thing is that, that <laughs> we'll be in a conversation, a piece of spinach right between my teeth. My other, friend, my other friend always says, something hanging out of my nose, you know. And the problem is you don't see it, you don't recognize it, because your focus is here, not here. I'm focusing on you right now, not, not on myself. Come on, I'm getting somewhere. You're focusing on what you can see and what you're busy with and what you have to do. And, and, and so um, after the service, you know, I go back, drink a bit of, bit of water, look into the mirror, see if I'm okay, and I smile at myself and I say, oh my goodness, what is this? And you realize that you never knew it was there, but everybody else saw it. Everybody else saw it, and nobody told you. See, even David had his focus here. David had to go and fight. David was doing what the Lord said he had to do. And while he was so focused here at his very own camp, where his wife and his, and his family and his kids and the soldiers with him, where all of the children were, their home base, while they were focusing here, the enemy attacked their home base. And David saw what was going on. They saw flames and smoke rising where they knew their camp were. But he was doing the Lord's work. He didn't do anything wrong. He was obedient. He didn't miss it. He was obedient, doing what the Lord said. He might have, you know, just been obe being obedient to that day. And the next moment he goes back to his own hometown and he realizes that the enemy came, took his wife, took his children, took everything they had, burnt everything down, and the men that was with David got upset. He said, David, we were fighting that battle, but the enemy came and took our own wives. And the Bible says they wanted to kill him. They were plotting to kill him. He didn't do anything wrong. He was doing the Lord's work. And nobody helped him. See, immediately, everybody answered themselves from him, saying it's his fault that this happened. But it was not his fault. He was obedient to God. They wanted to kill him. So the Bible says he took the ephod, wrapped it around himself, and he started praying. And the Bible says, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. And said, Lord, what do I need to do? The Lord said, pursue Pursue, go for it, don't get offended. Even if everybody left you, even if they pushed you aside, even if they want to take you out, go for it, pursue, go and take back that which belongs to you. Somehow God gave him a shock saying, David, you can give up right now, but I'm going to shock you. I'm going to bring life back into your body because I can just imagine when you get there where your wife is gone, your kids, are gone, everything you had is burnt down, and you can also get offended, saying, God, why did you allow this to happen? I was doing your work. I was looking out for you. Why didn't you look out for me? He could have gotten offended, but I think that moment when it hits you, you're like, what? And, and, and it says, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. Sometimes other people might not help you or support you. And you might not get the help that you wanted. But sometimes you have to encourage yourself because that does something different to your heart. 
There are people sitting here, even in this church, that's been here for many years, since the beginning. They know of the good things. They know of the bad things. Do you know why they are still here? It's because they look at the bigger picture. It's not about a person. It's not about a group of people. It's about the bigger picture. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here today. And so, if we don't help each other, we cannot grow. And I said, I started gymming at that time, and I realized I have to start with lightweights. So you start with lightweights, but I'm gymming alone. So I start with lightweights. I push it up. Good. I felt good. I could finish three reps, oh, no, 10 reps of three sets. I could do it. Now, next week, you come back, a little bit, a couple of more weights on it, and you gym. And that's how you grow. Your body get, gets used to the weight, then you put more weight on. And then you push again. And so when you do it that way, you will build in size. You will build. So you have to go heavier and heavier and heavier. That's how it works in church with people joining in. First of all, make them feel welcome. Pull them in. Phone them. You have to phone them regularly. Amen? So you have to chat with them. Get them involved. And then you trust them. Give them responsibility. Then they feel, I'm part of something. And so you continue to grow in certain ways. And with gym, it works the same way. And so here I am. I've gymmed about three months by myself, which is a very bad and very stupid idea. I'm going to tell you why. Because here I am, get to the gym, had my pre-workout in. It just kicked in. Felt amazing. I'm ready to bench. I put an extra weight on. I feel extra good today. Put an extra weight on. Here I am with the bench. I do one. And I go down. I get up and I, and I do two. And I, man, I feel, whoa, I feel pumped today, you know. And I put it up. And so sometimes when you, when you push yourself, you get a bit tired. Okay? So here I get to the third set. Feel great. Pumped. I'm not one of those guys who check yourself in the mirror. I didn't do that. But I felt great. I thought, okay, I'm going to go for it now and put some extra weights on. I'm going to break my record today because I'm pumped. I'm so excited. I'm ready for this. I get underneath the bench. One, yeah, two. David encouraged himself in the Lord. <laughs> on the third rep, that didn't work. So here I am, a heavy weight. And I'm pushing, and I can't get it up. And my arm starts shaking. And what do you do when that happens? You start looking around. Is there anybody, is there anybody here? And at that moment, the Lord says, see? I'm like, Lord, it's not a good time right now. <laughs> anybody else? <laughs> yeah. And the Lord says, see what I meant when I told you don't isolate yourself? That's exactly what I did for more than 10 years. I got offended in church. I'm a preacher. I'm a preacher with my own church. I got hurt in church. I isolated myself from everyone and everything. I always said, Jesus, me and you, we're good. I'm going to build this church and you're going to show me how. I don't need anyone or anything. And I'm pushing that weight. The Lord says, do you need someone to help you? Yes, Lord, please, right now. Not, not a bit, now, 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 now. So I'm shaking. The weight is coming down onto my neck. It's coming down, coming down. I'm looking around. I said, oh, please, Lord, help me. I'm going to die today. Death by gym or something. And I can't get it up. I'm weak. And I look around, and somebody I never expected to help me comes running. You know, but it's like in slow motion. I'm like. And that guy's coming, he's running through the weights. He's the only one that looked out for me. And it's an Indian guy. And his biceps bigger than my head, I promise you. I'm scared of him. He is massive. Here he comes running. And I said, yes, Lord, that's the right one. <laughs> yes, him, please. And he comes and he shouts, he says, man, are you okay? And I, and I can't say a word. I can't get a word out. He says, are you okay? And I, say, and I go and I say, no. He says, do you need help? And he comes, he says, can I be your spotter? <laughs> and he comes and he grabs the weights like this and he pulls it up. And to make it worse, he doesn't do it for me. He says, come on, you can do it. <laughs> I'm like, no, I can't. You do it. 
And he says, come on, man, push, you can do it. I said, no, I can't do it. Can't you see I can't do it? He said, no, you can do it. <laughs> and I'm like, and I, ah, and I, started, and I, never, I will never shout in the gym, but that day it was like a, it just came out, moanings and groanings. And I pushed, I gave it everything I had, and I put it up, and he helped me. Said, and he hit me on my chest. Yo, man, that's how you do it. I said, no, that's not, that's, that's not how you do it. That's not how you do it. And he was so excited. He was pumped. He said, yo, man. And he pulled me up. He said, um, can I be your spotter? I said, yes, please, from now on. What times do you, do you come to the gym? He said, no, I come early in the mornings and I gym. And he was just like, I, I don't know, he was high on, on pre-workout or something. But he was like, he was so excited. And out of the blue, without me even realizing, without me even knowing, you're, I'm building a relationship with someone that believes different than me. I forget about the idea because there's lots of guys with our church t-shirts in the gym. They all know me. None of them helped me. None of them saw what was going on. But he saw it and he helped me. And at the time, I, th- I felt like, what are they going to think? Because he swears every now and again. It's okay with, with, with him. And, and now he says, I want to, he wants to be my partner. And I'm like, what if he offends the guys that knows me in the gym? What if I push her weight and he... Beep, beep, you can do it. Because I hear them do that. And I'm like, what if I do that and he does that and everybody sees me gym with this guy and they're going to be offended, you know? And the Lord says, let him be your gym partner. I said, are you sure, <laughs> Lord, are you sure? And let him be your gym partner. And so I go to the gym every morning. I train with him. I gym with him. He swears all the way. I'm like, let's keep it down, man. <laughs> let's keep it down. And he's like, and, and, and he keeps on, and everybody sees me gymming with this guy. And I said, hey, I see you gym with him. I said, oh, no, no, he's, he's, my, he's my spotter. Okay, awesome. So God spoke to me at that time about a spotter. And he asked me, do you need a spotter? That Sunday, I went to church. I took a bench press, and I put weights. I put it on the stage. I went down with a heavy weight, and I called one of my friends. He said, will you be my spotter? And the Lord gave me a revelation. They're going to write a book on that now soon. It's going to be published soon. But the Lord spoke to me about being a spotter for other people. The Lord spoke to me about me needing other people. Can I ask you a question? Just put your hand underneath your leg. Try and lift yourself. (laughs) If you can do it, then you need to come preach today, okay? You can't lift yourself. All of us need someone. And that friend of mine didn't serve the Lord, didn't even know the Lord. But he helped me. I got that weight up. You know what the awesome thing is about other people helping you? Is that they're not doing it for you. They're helping you to do it. And just because you needed a little bit of help, that doesn't mean that you didn't do it. You still did it, but you needed help. Don't you know that the Lord has planned it that way, that we need each other? We were not created to be isolated. We were not created to be alone. And the biggest problem today is that we get isolated because we get hurt in our hearts. The Lord had to restore my heart, not with a born-again believer. The Lord had to restore my heart, not with a Christian, a Muslim, fully committed to his religion. But the Lord used him to restore my heart. The Lord used him to restore my heart, to reach out again to people, to trust people again, to support other people. Do you know how many times, even when I'm facing things in my own life, the Lord always says before I start preaching, remember it's not about you today, it's about the people sitting in the chair. Forget about yourself. (laughs) And I have to, (laughs) because I need to be your spotter. I can't do it for you, but I can help you finish it. I can't help you push through for what you're facing right now. What you might be facing right now might feel like it's your end. And it doesn't have to because you have people, and then they can help you with what you need. They have the muscles to help you finish that rep. You might not think that way, but there are people that God has put around you that can help you. I promise you that. God planned it that way, that we need to support each other. And you can either be one of the two. You can be the man at the bar of Bethesda, and 
every now and again the water gets stirred. But because you are paralyzed by your heart, that's hurt. You can lie right next to the healing. You can lie right next to the solution and still not receive it. And you can complain every time when Jesus comes along and says, but there's healing right next to you. There's healing in the water. You need just to climb in the water. Your excuse can be, Lord, but I had no one to put me in the water. Or you can be the friend that was lying on a bed, also paralyzed by sin, but he had four friends. He had four friends who just wouldn't quit. They didn't care if they broke the roof. They didn't care if they interrupted Jesus. They didn't take him for forgiveness. They took him for healing that day. Amen? They took him. They said, well, we're going through the roof, but he's going out through the door. He can't get himself there, but we can get him there. And he's too heavy. I'm not taking him back home. He's walking home. So here we see in that passage, we two different kinds of friends who had no one. The other one had people. Do you know that the biggest reason why we don't have people around us is not because of other people. It's because of our hurt hearts, our offended hearts. And a broken heart always pushes people away. Why? Not because you want to, but because you're scared. Because you're scared you're going to get hurt again. Because you're scared you're going to be disappointed again. Maybe in a relationship. Maybe you were too scared to trust someone again because you really gave your heart to somebody that you felt you had a future with and that person hurt you. Maybe that person cheated on you. I don't know what happened, but maybe something happened that hurt you, that offended you, and now you're closing your heart. And now the Lord is sending you somebody 10 times better, even better looking, (laughs) but you can't even see it because your heart is so offended. Because your heart is so broken. Somebody who would love you unconditionally, do anything for you. And that person might be right next to you. You might even know that person for five or ten years. But you won't open up your heart because you were offended. And God says, you are removing possibilities. You are moving the power that I can use you uh, in your life. You are removing all the possibilities because of your broken heart. And I always tell people, God is interested in your heart. He cares about your heart. God tested my heart. He didn't give me another option when my Muslim friend came running. You know what happened? That Muslim friend of mine, everybody knows him. I'm a big guy, well-known guy in Middleburg. He helped me. And here we gym together every morning, committed. We gym. We support each other. One morning he came and he was crying. I said, what's going on? He said, Yamon, my wife's going to leave me. I said, why? He said, because we can't have children. My wife's going to leave me. I said, no, man. And he said, Yamon, but you always talk about Jesus. <laughs> and he had an attitude. I'm not going to lie, he had an attitude. You always talk about Jesus, and I, I, I had to concentrate not to get offended. And he said, you always talk about this Jesus, and he can do this, and he can do that. Well, if your Jesus can help us have babies then I might consider believing in what you're saying. I said, oh, thank you, Lord. I grabbed him right there in in, in the gym. I said, Lord Jesus, thank you that you're going to give them a baby. And that's the best opportunity. You can't slack down there. You you have to take that opportunity, that open window right there. I took it right there. I prayed with him. We go on. We continue to gym. Every week I ask him, are you guys okay? Are you doing well? Yeah, you know, I'm not doing well. One morning I get up. I feel it's a normal morning. I go in gym. I start. I wait for him. And somebody grabs me around my body, hugs me, squeezes me. I've almost felt I'm under attack, you know. I wanted to defend myself. But he squeezed me. And I, I felt tears dropping in my neck without him saying a word. I turned around. He grabbed me on my chest. Like, he's a very serious, solid, tough guy, okay. The tough guy says he's tough. Okay? He's one of those guys. And he grabbed me like this. He said, Jamon. I said, what? What happened? What happened? Sorry, what? And he said, my wife's pregnant, man. He grabbed me and he hugged me. And, and today they have a beautiful, beautiful baby daughter. Beautiful. Weeks later, 
He complains, I can't come to gym. I said, why? He said, I can't come to gym. I said, why? And he said, my asthma, my asthma. And he says, well, well, Jesus healed you guys, and you've got a baby, and, you know, let me pray for your asthma. He said, I'll come to gym tomorrow. <laughs> he came to gym the next day, said, okay, pray for my asthma. I said, but first of all, you need to know that Jesus loves you. And the second thing, I know you always say we believe the same. We don't. You believe he's a prophet. I believe he's his son. There's 99 wonderful names for Allah, but not one of them is love. I looked at him and I said, he's the God of love. Jesus loves you so much. It's not about you performing. It's about him loving you. He loves you. Therefore, he's going to heal you. He had to use an asthma pump every day, every single day, about three or four times, just to be able to breathe. He stopped using that asthma pump that morning. Never used it again. Do you know how awesome it was to see how the Lord did something that I never expected because I weren't so caught up in my own ways, my own plan, my own church, my own life, my own marriage, my own friends, my own this, 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 because that's what ruins a church is a clique. Yeah, but it's Oscar Ngiki. <laughs> Look at the bigger picture. A church is not a place for the qualified or the elite, or those serving Jesus more than five years. The church needs to be a hospital for the sick. If there's somebody sitting next to you that smells like alcohol, that smells as if they just got out of a shabine, then praise the Lord, he's in church. We have to look at the bigger picture. We have to look at the, the bigger plan that God has. And yet the Lord opened up my eyes to see that we need people. Your Moses is at the war and Joshua is fighting. And Moses, also offended by the people, tired of the people, always complaining, always moaning. He got angry quite a couple of times with the people. And your Moses is holding up the staff. And he gets to a point where he's tired. He can't do it anymore. And here the Lord sends two guys who offended him. <laughs> Come on with the, with the golden calf, her and Aaron. Yeah, the Lord sends them. They say, Moses, you can't keep the staff up anymore. And every time you take it down, Joshua is losing the battle at the bottom. We need to do something. And here the two men came and held up his arms. They didn't do it. Moses did it, but they helped him. See, God wants to win battles. He wants to win wars. He wants to help you win every battle you face. But you will need people. I promise you that. I've tried doing it by myself for a long time. And I'm so sad. I'm so disappointed in myself for getting so offended. I could have had wonderful relationships. Things that took me five years could have taken me one year. And I can share so much with you today. I can say so much today. And many of you say, and I've heard people say that before. Yeah, I went through a tough time, but I'm through it. I went through a tough time, but I'm through it. I understand. I'm, I'm glad. You know, I've, I've also gone through things in my life, and I'm through it. But God does not want you just to get through it. Pastor, what do you mean? God wants you to get through the fire and not smell like smoke. Let me say it again. Don't say, I, I got through the fire, praise the Lord, but you smell like smoke. You went through things in your life. Yes, you're through it, but your heart is broken. That doesn't help. Can I get an amen? Yeah, but I went through this and this, and I didn't understand why that had to happen to me and this, and, but I'm through it. You know, I'm through it, but you're so hurt, you're so broken, but you're through it. God doesn't work that way. God doesn't take you out of Egypt poorer than what you went in. The Bible says they were more than overcomers. They went out of Egypt with the gold of the Egyptians. If God lets you go through something, you always get out better than what you get, went into. You are always more blessed when you get out of it with God. So God wants you to go through things in your life, yes, only to strengthen you, only to support you. And it's not Him letting you go through it. It is ourselves who lets us go through it. God is good. He can only do good. In Him, there's no shadow of turning. He can only give light. 
Amen? But the wrong mistakes you make and the wrong things you do, He turns that around to bless you at the end. He uses it at the end to protect your heart and look after your heart, cause you to grow. You know, if there's no, if, if, if there's no challenge, there's no growth. In gym, you have to put the weight heavier, heavier to grow and get bigger. There needs to be a bit of a challenge. That's why when people, when I see people who've been through things in their lives, I enjoy talking to them. I enjoy talking to deep people. I don't like when people complain about shallow things. I'm that guy's going to say, there's a spinach here. You're complaining about this and this and this, but do you know what? The other guy went through. And the Lord opened up my eyes many times, even when I complained about, but this guy did that. And Lord, why would he do this? And he said this and he lied about this. And I would be upset. And you know what the Lord would tell me? Forgive him. And I'm like, but why? He didn't say sorry. He says, because if you would stand in front of me with him, I won't love you more than him. I love him just as much as I love you. Forgive him. <laughs> and that's how the Lord is with me as well. The Lord is brutally honest with me as well. He won't give me any opportunity to complain or to get upset or angry. He's honest with me always. And so we can look at all these stories in the Bible, and I realize that God wants us to go through the fire. And when we go through the fire, also not smell like smoke. What does that mean? That means... That God wants to use all the hurt, all the things that was meant to destroy you or hurt your heart or offend your heart. And He wants to turn those things around to build character in you. He wants to build character in you. You might be here today and say, yeah, but that business partner cheated me 10 years ago. That's why I'm still struggling to get ahead. Maybe the problem is not what he did. Maybe the problem is that you're still offended about it. And God cannot do something new in your business because you're still holding on to those grudges. Maybe if you forgive him, God's going to bless your business abundantly. I've seen that happen over and over again with our businessmen that I work with. Over and over again. If they complain about their income or contracts, I ask them, who did you not forgive? No, that guy, and it's his fault. Forgive him. Lord's going to give you a better one. God wants you to go through it and not smell like smoke. And so there is Daniel's once... I don't want to be too long today. I still want to pray for you. But Darius Daniels once spoke about him and his dad. And him and his dad were playing basketball. And they jumped. And, they, and when they came down, um, he fell on his father. And his father break, uh, broke his, his pinky. It's a finger gebreek. And Darius said to his dad, Dad, but please go to the hospital. Let them fix it. Otherwise... It's going to heal wrong. You're going to get this today. And, he, and he's old school. He said, no, 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 I'm fine. Don't worry, I'm fine. How many of us do that? People say, there's something here. No, there's not. No, no, we, we can see there's, a, there's something here. No, there's nothing in my teeth. No, no, no less seriously, there's something here. No, there's not. Isn't that silly? When we do that, well, what even is worse, we, we don't want to offend people. So when somebody does something wrong, and everybody knows they're doing something wrong, <laughs> but we all stay quiet about it. People ask you, why didn't you help him? It's like, no, no, I, you know, I love him so much, you know. I love him so much, I'm not going to discipline him. I'm, I'm not going to say this. I'm, I'm not going to... I'm not going to go to him and talk to him about that problem because I really love him. If somebody drowns in the water and they are shouting, help me, help me, are you going to say, you know what, I love him so much. Leave him. I love him so much. I don't want to offend him. He'll get through it. Leave him. I love him. Are you going to do that when somebody calls out for help? That's why pastors aren't good lifesavers. I see that hand, brother. I see that hand, brother. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> you get the joke? Okay, okay. <laughs> just to be sure. 
So nobody will say that if somebody's drowning. Say, oh, I love him so much, you know. Just. No, you're going to jump in. If, if your child is, is heading for the warm plate, are you going to say, oh, I love my child so much. Let them learn their lesson. Are you going to do that? No. You're going to jump out. Don't you know that the Pharisees, all of them were just waiting? The Bible says they were waiting, standing at the door, waiting for the lady to be caught in the, in the act of adultery. They were waiting for her to make the mistake. They were waiting for her. Why didn't one of them go say, hey, hey, don't go in there. Hey, wait, wait, let's go for a burger. You want to go for a burger? I'm going to take you out for a milkshake. Let's go and do something quickly because all of them are just waiting for you to make a mistake. All of them because you know what? They want to kill you. That's what the devil does. That's what he does. Give him enough rope to hang him. No, take away the rope. Give him Jesus. Step in. Do something. You know, that guy could have left me with the weight. He could have left me there. See, you know, I told him. I saw this coming. But he ran and he helped. Today in churches, I said at another church a while ago, I said, if your pastor did something that troubled you, go and speak to him. Go and tell him, hey, <laughs> what you said troubled me, and I don't understand why you said it. It offended me, and I thought, why did you say that? And, and, and the pastor might say, oh, you know why? Because this and this and this happened. That's what I went through. Oh, you know, we need more of those okay moments. I'm not going back to that church because that happened with my child in, in children's church. I'm very upset, and my child told me exactly what happened. Please don't trust your child. At a time, I was in, 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 in a part of the, the, the leadership group of a school in Middleburg. And the, the, the headmaster would always say, people, when we have meetings, people, we won't believe what your children tell us about you if you don't believe what your children tell you, tell you about us, okay? Because your children tell us everything that happens at your house. So we won't believe it. So don't do the same. And so, it was, okay, but let's we could talk about it then. Okay, let's talk about it. Okay, my child said that happened in children's church. Oh, you know what, but your child did this and this, and that's why I had to take those steps. And Oh, that's not how I had it. Yeah, but you could have left because of that. But now that we talked about the elephant in the room, now we know why, and now we're building a relationship. Now we're getting through it, and we're not smelling like smoke. See, people that have been through a lot in their lives will treat it that way. Will do it that way because they know there's more to it than just my opinion. When you look at me, there might be things that might offend you about me. Maybe even this black t-shirt this morning. I don't know. I had another t-shirt, I promise. A nice one with buttons, blocks, everything. It doesn't fit anymore, unfortunately. But there might be a lot of things that, that might offend you about me. And I promise you, I might, for some reason, offend you, maybe a couple of years later. But if you come and talk to me about it, I can tell you why. Let me use this last example. Is that okay with you? Am I taking too long? How long does Bruce, Bruce usually preach? <laughs> okay. No, I'm just joking. You know what happened to me a couple of weeks ago? I was busy doing the work of the Lord. I was, I was going to buy a new computer for our church. So I went onto Facebook Marketplace. I saw a computer for a wonderful, too good to be true price. Usually, when it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true, okay? Uh, silly me, always naive, always naive. So I'm like, I'm going to go buy that PC. I speak to the guy. He says, yes, we'll wait here for you and... So I'm like, oh, man, I'm getting a bargain today. So I'm dry, I drove through to Johannesburg like every day, like a normal every day, get to Johannesburg. Next moment I stop, and I want to get directions. So I quickly stop, and I saw there was a police station close by. So I said to the one guy standing there, listen, I just want to go to the police station. I'm going to meet the guys there and then buy the computer. And I, started, I felt uncomfortable immediately. I felt uncomfortable, and immediately I started 
get back to my car. So I turned around. As I turned around, somebody stuck an object in my back. And he grabbed me around my neck, like my shoulder, like this. He said, keep walking. Keep walking. Stay quiet. Keep walking. I said, what's going on? And they said, no, keep walking. If you want to see your family again, do what I say. So I, I wasn't sure if it was a gun or a knife. But they had it behind my back. And they said, keep walking. And so the next moment, he pushed me around an area. And two other guys jumped out. The one, and they tackled me. And I wanted to fight. And until they held the whip, they pushed it in my back really hard and put a knife against my neck. And the one guy kept on saying, you're never going to see your family again. You're never going to see your family again. So they forced me on my knees, forced me to take off my shoes, took everything I had. Luckily, they couldn't find my keys. My keys was in my pocket. So here I am on my knees, and the one guy says, oh, just, just kill him, just kill him, take his stuff, let's go. And they tried to get my face to open up my iPhone to, to get into my accounts withdraw the money. Here I am, and I'm on my knees, and I realize what's going on. And the guy keeps on saying, I'm never going to see my family again, never going to see my family again. And so here I am on my knees, not knowing what to do. So, so here I am, thinking, am I going to fight? Because I'll do that. Do I need to fight? Or do I need to run? Or what, do I need to just work with them? But the more the guy said, we're going to kill him anyway. We're going to kill him anyway. We're going to, the more I feel, okay, so I need to get away or I need to fight now. I need to make a decision now. So as I'm, as I'm on my knees, I said to the, I held the one guy like this. I don't know why, but I held him like this. And I said, just wait, 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 wait. My friend's coming. My friend's coming. And he said, where's your friend? Where's your friend? And he looked around the one corner and the one guy still had a knife around my neck. And the other one took the other things that I had and wanted to take my shoes and so they got to a place and said, no, let's get to his, go to his car. Then we can go to the bank, get his account. They, they can do all of that. So they said, put your shoes on again. So I put it on. And as I put it on, I felt the Lord said, run. Run. And the next moment, I, I, I remember as I sat there, I said, Lord, but you give me an opportunity because I have to get loose. The knife is still around my neck. I have to, I have to get away, but how am I going to do it? And so here I am. And I'm saying, Lord, but something needs to happen. Tell me when. Tell me when. So <clears throat> I'm busy standing there. My whole body is shaking. And the next moment I say, Lord, tell me when. Tell me when. And as the guy kept on looking for my friend, I said to the one guy, I don't feel well. Wait, wait, wait. I went like this just to feel where they were. And I felt where he was. And the next moment, somebody blew a whistle. I don't know from where. I think it's a, a community thing. They do that in a community. So if they see something happening, they, they blow a whistle to get their attention. As I stood there, I heard a whistle blow really loud and continuously, frantically. And the guys all looked up. And as they looked up, I took the one guy, threw him down, pushed the other guy away, and I started running. I started running. Grabbed my keys, opened up like Rambo, you know, 007. Look, look. Ran, look, look, but all these lights go on. I see the doors are open, open up the door, jump in, put my foot to the middle, and I drove, and I drove, and as I drove back home, I said, Lord, I'm just so thankful that right now I can be in my car on my way home, and you know what happens? In moments like that, then you really don't worry about people who offended you at church, <laughs> you know? You don't really care about the one band member that didn't show up that Sunday. You don't really care about those things at that moment. You don't really care about uh, the things that your children did in that week. All you care about is I want to hug them. I want to feel them. You don't, you don't worry about what your wife did. You just want to see her, grab her, hug her, tell her you love her. That's all you want to do. You know what I say to myself? You mourn every single day when you wake up. From now on, you're going to remind yourself of what you feel like right now. And whenever somebody says something about you, forgive them immediately. Love them immediately. Mother Teresa always says, if you judge other people, then you have no time to love them. And as I drove back, I was upset, okay? I'm not going to lie. I was a bit upset. I was a bit upset. And the next moment I sat there, I said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they were doing. When I thought about the cross of Jesus, 
while they were crucifying him, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they were doing. Jesus never opened up a door for him to be offended. He immediately locked that door with love. He locked that door with grace and mercy. And many times, my friends would return and come to me and tell me, yeah, but we did this to you, and we said that about you. I said, what? No, we did this and this. I said, I know, but I forgave you for that a long time ago. Come, let's go and have a bride. Let's come to church. Let's... You don't offend me. I promise you, whatever you do, you won't offend me. That's how I start all my counseling sessions. Listen, whatever you're going to say right now, whatever you need help with, don't worry, I know it all. You're not going to offend me. Nobody will find out. How can I help you, man? Really? Yes. Okay, I did this and I did that. <laughs> I said, well, God can get you out of it. I promise you he can. You won't offend me. Whatever you do, you won't offend me. I've been through too much in my life to be offended. I'm just happy to be alive. And I don't want to offend people, but I want to be real. I want to be real. I don't want to come and stand here as if I'm a holy Joe. I never do something wrong. I have a lot of mistakes. I still make mistakes. But every time when I make a mistake, I'm reminded of how great His love is for me. Lord, I'm not yet yet. I'm not yet there. But I know you still love me. I know that I've made, made mistakes. And, I, and I've done this. And I've done, but Lord, you still love me. You still care for me. And help me to focus on the bigger picture. So what I wanted to ask today, what I want to call this sermon today is, are you okay? Have you ever had somebody coming up to you out of the blue saying to you, are you okay? It's always the way they ask it. There's never the question. It's the way they ask it. Are you okay? And Darius Daniel said that, those words to his dad. He said, Dad, are you okay? His dad said, John, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. Look, look, look. But he broke his pinky. And two years later, they sat at the table, and they were eating. And Darius said, said Dad, see, you lied to me. You weren't okay. He said, what do you mean? And it's like, the, like this. What do you mean it's fine? <laughs> no, that is not fine. And his finger didn't heal correctly. It was like this. And he, and he said, Dad, just go to the doctor. I know you're tough. I know you're tough. Just go to the doctor. Let them operate your finger. Let them fix it. And he said, no, you know, the doctor said, at the moment I have a 60% use of my pinky but you know, that's okay. And he said, Dad, why do you want to have 60% use of your pinky if you can have 100% use? And he said, no, because the doctor said for in, in order for him to fix it, he'll have to break it again. And he said to his son, I don't want to go through that pain again. How many of you are sitting here and you've taken hits in your life. Your heart has been hurt. And you are sitting here, and you know, you know, that your heart's capacity is at 80%. Or your heart's capacity is on 60%. And God wants to give you a new heart that functions on 100%. But you're acting as if everything is okay. Now, I don't want to dig up all things. I don't believe in doing that. But I don't want you to go through the fire with less than what you went in. That's not how God works. That's not the Lord. That's the devil. If you can say today that you have come through things in your life and you are better off today, then that's God. But if you went through things in your life and you still hurt about it, you still offend it, you can't trust people anymore, you can't love anyone anymore, you always isolate, you always withdraw, get offended easily, get angry quickly, it means that your heart is not functioning the way it's supposed to. God wants you to go through things in your life when you go through it, because we all go through things. 
like I said, he's not the one that's causing you to go through it. It's just, it's life. It's life. Do you know what the Lord said to me immediately after those guys almost took my life? Because I know of another man, also a preacher, also went to go buy something. They burnt him in his car. After they withdrew all his funds out of his accounts, his life is taken. His family never saw him again. And they told me the whole time, you're never going to see your family again. There's nothing worse you can tell me. The devil knows exactly what things to do and what to bring against you. He knows exactly what to do. I love my family. Look, I love the Lord of all my heart. Yo, man, I love my girls and I love my two boys. I love my wife. I know they love me. Sometimes we go through hard times, difficult things. You know what? But whenever I go through something, I say, Lord, I'm willing to go through this. But I want to be better off when I get out of it. I want to be like Job. But I don't want to take 40 chapters before I get there. If you get to those points, you realize that every second of your life is important. You don't, there's no time anymore to get offended. I'm sorry, but I get upset when people get offended. I know I shouldn't. But I'm like, come on, there's no time to get offended anymore. I spend enough time with families falling apart, people's lives falling apart, to know that I can't, I can't get offended anymore. There's no time to get upset anymore about little things or small things. There will always be things in church that will offend you. Always. Always. Your husband will always do something to offend you. I promise you he will. <laughs> Your wife will always do something to offend you. Always. Always. But you are married to him not to fix him. You are married to him to love him. Amen. Amen. I enjoy that guy. What's your name? You won. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I know it's not you won. <laughs> I enjoy you because you know why, man? You're real. You're real. I want to be real. I would rather offend you than neglect you. I would rather offend you than just leave here today and know that I didn't accomplish what I had to do. But I cannot let you go out of this building today. Now, seriously, I'm going to lock the doors today. <laughs> I won't let you get out of this building or go out of this building today if you didn't re-examine your heart today. I'm sorry. You can say, I'm fine. No, I'm fine. Look, I'm fine. I want to ask you today, are you okay? Come on, dads. The most difficult thing is to find that balance. What balance? There's, I've found balance. Now, the difficult thing in... And with us dads is to find the balance to make enough money to look after your family and to spend enough time with your family. That's a deal breaker in many marriages. Wives, I promise you, you don't always know what your husband is going through because your husband is in that, in, is in that fight, is in that balance. He's trying to provide as a father, but he also wants to spend time. If you continually take him on, you're not enough with the kids and you're not spending enough time with the kids and you're not this. And then he says, but I want to, but I'm, I'm, I also want to provide for them. You're putting me in a spot where I'm, where I'm torn between two things. I don't know what to do. I also can't sit at home the whole day with my kids and with you and not able to pay all the bills. Come on, there's a balance. Let's get past it. I believe there's a reason why Paul comes to a point where he says, let's get past all these elementary teachings. Let's get past all these, these feelings, this quick offense or this easy offense or this quick to anger. Let's get past all these things. Let's focus on what's important. And sometimes when you go through a situation like what I went through, I start to realize what's important again. And my brutally honest, look how awesome it was, my brutally honest sermon when I was crying in front of my church, that happened the very next Wednesday. When the people found out 
Everybody was in church, in church that next Sunday. I promise you. And they brought friends. <laughs> they re also realized, man, we get so caught up in our own lives that we, that we miss the bigger picture. So Darius Daniel's dad said, I don't want to relive that pain. I want it to be 100%, but I don't want to relive that pain. Maybe today, the Lord's not saying relive the pain. It's just saying, let's, let's fix that. It's Resurrection Sunday today. Why don't you allow the Lord today to resurrect your heart again? Let it beat at 100%. Why not today when we walk out of this building, we start loving people different. We start loving people unconditionally. We start loving our husbands unconditionally. Forgive them for what happened. And let's just love each other, man. When I came home, my wife wouldn't leave me. She would continuously cry in my neck and hold on to me. I said, why can't it be like this every day? Why, why do we have to go... Through a life and death situation before you realize how much you love me. <laughs> and every now and again, if something happens, I tell, uh, it's by grace. Come. Come in for the hug. Why don't we remind ourselves today, hey, if your name is Johan, or if it's Kues or Pete, hey, hey, Pete. You've been through things, but you're through it. But now it's time for that smoke smell to disappear. It's no tijd for I see her. I take Anno, I take Faso on. It's tijd for Don Vach to go. And as I said earlier, your heart's in the middle. The place where you have heard, but now I've seen. That needs to happen. But your heart's in the middle, not your mind. If you can figure out why things happened in your life, then you don't need God. If you can know why things happen and this and this, and if you can figure out God, then you don't need Him. I said it to a friend of mine. He's a very successful, successful businessman, but he's very analytical. He plans out everything. Everything. It's the worst thing for him to come to church. Okay? Because I don't do it that way. I also have structures. I also have ways of how I do things. Even it, if it doesn't look that way, I know exactly how I'm going to do it, when I'm going to do something. But he's like, and I see him sit there in church, and he's just always laughing. He's, he's the only guy that always laughs at all my jokes, always. But at a time I said, but you're more hard, this and this and this. And I stopped him right there. I said, man, no, no, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, it's the most difficult thing it's the biggest challenge ever to go with him on a hunting trip. I said to him, when you're going to see the buck, I promise you, you're not going to be able to make this equation and the wind and this. I said to him, when you're going to get there and if you see the buck in, in, in the scope, you're going to just get the best aim and shoot, okay? And I said, the same way with God. And he said, yeah, but why this and how this? I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. If you can figure God out, then you don't need him. From now on, I want to ask you, don't try and figure everything out. Just trust God. Just trust Him. He said, okay. You know how his life changed? His business was successful, but he's now opening franchises all over. He's so blessed, you know. And it's so amazing to see how the Lord can do a small thing and change your life completely. But it has to Start somewhere. It has to start somewhere. You have to get those, poof, that shock to get that heartbeat going again. But you have to make a decision. Don't give up on your marriage. Please don't. The happiest marriages today that I've seen were people who didn't try to fix each other. You know what I always tell my, my couples when I, when I counsel them and marry them? I always tell them, he's not your project, he's your promise. Your wife is not your project, she's your promise. It's easy to find faults. 
It's easy to find mistakes. Come on, it's easy. We are called to love each other. It's easy to get offended. It's easy to get upset. But you don't know what the other person's going through. So rather, don't get offended. Just love them. I want us to stand together this morning. Can we stand together? I want to just say where you are. I want to just, just to close your eyes today and help me, Lord. I, I just want to pray for you today. And there might be things, even until today, that you might not understand. But don't let your head get in the way where your heart should be. Your head can easily get in the way. And that's why you hear, but you can't see. That's why your heart needs to be there. Because your heart will open up the door for you to see. God doesn't use our minds. He uses our hearts. God is interested in your heart. And that day when I was driving away from the accident or the situation, the Lord immediately said to me, Yamon, quickly forgive them, forgive them, forgive them. And I was like, I was so upset. But the Lord said, Yamon, quickly forgive them. You know why? Because he was looking after my heart. Lord, I want to pray today that as people are standing in this building, that you will restore hearts. Lord, I pray that the people that's in this building will be more committed to this church than ever before. It's not Pastor Bruce's church. It's not Anya's church. Lord, it's your church. It's your bride that we need to look after. Our involvement in this church is important. Us showing up on a Sunday or at the other meetings, it's important to your bride, to you. We're not doing it for anyone else but you, Lord. We're supporting our pastors because of you. We're supporting our friends because of you. Next week, I'm inviting somebody to this church because of you. Because you care for this church. Because you care for the person that I invite to church. Lord, I pray that today you will open up our eyes, that our eyes will not be caught up in our own situation, our own lives, our own problems, that we will look away from all that distract unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. That's the scripture that I wanted to read this morning. But let us look away from all that distract today. Today there might be many distractions, many things that your head and your mind is putting in front of you, but rather look for your heart, fill with your heart, have compassion on people, be kind. You never know what they're facing. You never know what someone else is going through. Be kind. I pray for everyone this morning, Jesus. Come on. Give us new hearts. I'm not asking restore our hearts. I'm praying, Lord, give us new hearts. Give us new hearts for people. Give us new hearts for the lost. This church building must have been too small many years ago. Give us new hearts for the lost. Let us not drive past people and not care about them, Lord. Let us not walk past somebody and not care about them. Give us new hearts for people, new hearts. Give us new hearts for this church. Lord, give us new hearts for everyone in this building today. Give us new hearts. Let my heart function at 100%. I'm tired of functioning on 60%, 80%, 70%. I know that I've got more to give. And I want to ask this morning, I know that I'm taking a lot of time. I know that you might have plans for today. And I don't want to mess up those plans, but I believe that God wants to do something for you today. So if you are here today, and if you say, Pastor Yamon, 
that's that's me. That's that that's me. I've been hurt, I've been offended, and I so desperately want to get free from it. I so desperately want to live 100% again. And I feel like I'm just not getting there. It feels like I don't have fuel in the tank to get on that 100%. I want, I want it to happen again, but I don't know how to do it. If that is you, I want to ask you to come to the front. Let's come to the front. Come on, real quick. If you say, I need prayer, I need somebody to pray with me. I need a spotter. I need a spotter. I'm pushing this weight, but I'm not getting it there. I'm 80%, but I'm not getting it there. I want to get it there. Come on, if you need somebody to pray with you, I want you to come to the front. Come on, real quick, real quick, real quick. Let's come to the front. I know once Darius did that invitation, I ran to the front. Man, I was the first one there. I said, that's me. That's me. I want to function at 100%. Maybe it's in your business. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's in your own personal life. No one knows. You know. You know. But today you need to forgive. You need to let go. You need to go for that operation to fix that thing that's working at 80%. So everybody, you're in front. You know what to pray for. So I'm just going to touch and agree. Is that okay with you? There we go. You know what to pray for. The reason why you came to the front is because the Holy Spirit spoke to you this morning. Even if you're in your chair, that's okay. If that's you, I want you just to thank the Lord right now that He's making things whole once again. He's making it whole once again. The Lord's going to turn your mess into a message. He's going to turn your test into into a testimony. He's going to turn your problem into a promise. Amen? I'm just going to touch and agree. I want to be that spotter. I'm going to take this oil. I'm just going to touch your hands, and I'm going to say, I agree. Thank you for restoration. Thank you for newness. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Your plans that you have, it's not too big. The Lord's been showing you a couple of things lately, and you've, you've withheld it. You didn't share it because you were scared. What if it doesn't happen? And then I've shared it to everyone, and it, didn't, it doesn't happen. The Lord says, don't be too scared. I've put that in your heart. I will send you the right people that you need to share it with because you need more guys to agree with you. But you're scared to trust people because people have, have neglected you. Not offended. They haven't cheated you. It's different with you. They've neglected you. They didn't look after you the way they were supposed to. They didn't honor their agreements. That's what I see. I feel the Lord says he's sending the right people. You're going to be like Job. <laughs> you're going to say, I've heard. Now I see. There he goes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. (laughs) Your plans are much bigger than than South Africa. It's it's much bigger than, yeah, yeah. Don't limit yourself. Don't limit yourself. You've got the capacity. Thank you, Jesus. I touch and I agree in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. I touch and I agree. Yes, Lord, 100%. Complete restoration. I pray that all trauma will go. That network in her brain will be connected correctly. I pray for all the trauma to go. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. 100%. Come on, if you are in your chair, pray with me. Put out your hands to the front. Let's all agree. Thank you, Jesus. 100%. 100%. Thank you, Jesus. New things. New things. Thank you, Jesus. All hurts. Restored. Now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. 100%. Thank you, Jesus. 100%. 
restoration. Whew. In Jesus' name. Yes, joy. God's going to give you back your joy. You're going to bubble more than ever before. That what you feel you've lost is going to give it back to you more than ever. More than ever in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. 100%. 100%. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I don't see integrity. Integrity is, is something big for you. I don't know if you have a company, but I see integrity. I see like a Logan or like a, like a, like a logo, a slogan. I see integrity, like a LED light shining on a big building. I don't know why, but I see it. Integrity. Yes, Lord, I want to thank you that you will use him mightily. Open up the correct doors. Put the right people around him. Thank you, Jesus. 100%. Function 100%. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You've come a long way. You've come a long way. The Lord says, be expectant. Be ready for what's to come. There's new things. There's new things. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 100%. 100%. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you for your anointing. Restoration. 100%. Not stuck at 80%. You've got so much more to give. The Lord says, I've put so much in you. Start giving it more than ever before. Let it flow out of you like a stream of living water. Don't let anything block it. I've put a lot in you for other people around you. The gift that's for you is actually for other people. Start sharing it. Thank you, Jesus. Show her how. Show her how. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. A healed heart can heal others. 100%. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I agree 100% today. Thank you. As I put this oil on her, let her be anointed to do your work. Let her be anointed. I just want to tell you today, you are not disqualified. You are not disqualified. Okay? You are pre-qualified. Okay? With Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 100% in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. You have every reason to be upset. You have every reason to be angry. But I feel the Lord says, thank you. He's proud of you for protecting your heart. Keep on doing it. There's good things to come. There's good things to come. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. New things, new things. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this oil. It speaks of breakthrough. It speaks of new things. Let it be set apart for your use. I just feel there's good things that have come your way. There's good influences. But I just, I just want to tell you today that I'm glad you, that you said no to many of those things. Because God says all of them would have been acceptable, but I have something perfect for you. And I've kept you for that reason. For where you are right now, you're exactly where you need to be. I don't know how to say it, but you're exactly where you need to be. The Lord says, I've put you aside for something very specific. And you know what it is. You know what it is. Step into it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 100%. Well, are you all praying with me this morning? Amen. I want to give everybody a word, but I don't want to keep you too long. Thank you, Jesus, because I know that I'm also, I also respect your time. Thank you, Jesus. 100%. Come on, let's all pray. Let's all stand together. Let's all pray. Thank you, Jesus. We agree. We pray. Come on, put out your hands to the front. 100%. You know why you are here? And the Lord says, it shall be done, and you're actually standing in the gap for someone else, but it shall be done. It shall be done. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord is doing something great in your heart. Thank you, Jesus. Just receive it like a child. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, 100%. Keep him, protect him with your love, God. Protect him, protect him. Use him as a man of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Influencer, I see an influencer on your heart. Influencer, you're going to be a great influence for people around you. Make sure your heart is in the right place and your heart beats for God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 100%, 100% functioning at 100%. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I just really felt I wanted to touch everyone and pray. 
I could have asked everybody to pray with me. I know. I just really felt I had to do it today. Thank you, Jesus. 100%, 100%, 100%. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, both of you, I'm going to touch it like this. I see camps, like marriage camps. I don't know if you like to picnic, but I see you're going to do it a lot more from now on. You're going to have, I don't know why, but I see like picnic, marriage picnics, how you get people together in marriage, how you talk about marriage, talk about life, and brutally honest, not anything held back. You speak about everything, intimacy, you speak about um, respect, honor, love, giving. You're going to speak about all that very, 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 very clear and very open. I don't know if that's in your hearts, but, but you guys have been through a lot. But, but you know what? You can come back and you can say, hey, we've been, we've been there. We've gone through the bushes, but we saw the mountaintop and we know what we saw. But hey, guys, we can help you. Come on, let's help you get through your marriage. I can see how you're going to help a lot of people in marriage with their marriages. Oh, you're going to save so many marriages. You're going to save, God's going to use you to save so many broken relationships, so many children's lives that would have been ruined. You're going you're gonna to help those two people to stick together. To save that family. I can see it. Thank you, Lord. You open up the doors in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. As you are strong physically, Lord's going to make you strong spiritually as well. Very strong to be a pillar to many men and women around you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for his life. Thank you, Lord, for his beautiful daughter. I bless them. In Jesus' name. <laughs> you are worried, just like me. I want to be the best dad ever. I just want to tell you today that your dad, your father, is telling you today, you're a good dad. Don't doubt it. You're a good dad. You're a good husband. I don't know you, but I feel the Lord says that I need to tell you that today. Don't doubt that. You know what the Lord once said to me? You have, you do have an example. You know what the Lord said to me? He said, look at me, I'm your dad. You do have an example of how to be a good dad. I'm your dad. I want to tell you that today. The Lord says, he's your dad. The way he cares for you, just care for your kids the same way. You're not going to fail Okay, I break that lie over your life. It's something I had to deal with three years ago. I felt I was busy failing. And God shook me out of it. He said, you're not. Stop believing that lie. You're going to be very successful. Very successful in all areas of your life. Very blessed. Thank you, Lord, that you will bless this family. Will you just hold your husband's hand like that? Bless this family, Lord. Bless them abundantly with more than enough. Your hearts have always been to be a blessing to others. The Lord's going to use you to bless others. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for a hedge of protection around this family. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Beautiful. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence. Open up your heart for new songs, new ways, new in inventing ways of worship. Open up your heart for it. There's new things coming. 100%, 100%. That he will worship 100% with all his heart, all his strength. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed, blessed, blessed. Lord says, you're an intercessor, but lately you've been very worried. Lord says, that, that I've stolen your focus. The Lord says, give it to me. Just give it to me. You don't have to carry, carry that burden. Just keep on praying. Keep on standing in the gap, but give it to me. 100%. Thank you, Jesus. 100%. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord says, I've got it. I've got it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. We bless this church. All these kids, we bless everyone. A while ago in our church, I said, bring all the kids to the front. We want to pray for all of them. 
we, we've got a big bowling. We, we, can, we can seat about 1,200 people in, in our bowling. And so here I, I say, before the service, call the kids to the front. We want to pray for all of them. I realized it's going to take the whole service to pray for all of them. They were from one side of the building to all the other side of the building. But we have such a, such a big responsibility to look after the hearts of our children. But we need healed hearts. Everybody, I want to ask today that, that you be a blessing today to this church and, and to your pastors. Not to me. Not to me today. I know that I'm invited to preach it today. But my goal here today is to strengthen you and your pastors. Your pastors. Okay? So today, when you give, I want you not to give to me. The Lord have blessed me. But I want you to give to your pastors today. Can we do that today? They're not here. That's why I can do what I'm doing right now because they're not here. But I want you to bless them today. I want you to be their spotters today. Even me, I'm also going to give today because I want to bless your pastors. I don't want you to give me anything. Do not do. Okay? We've seen nothing. Actually, actually, I guess we're not school. Yes, we've seen it. Do not actually. I want everyone here today to put something together for your pastors, for Bruce and Anya. And you're not giving it to them, you're giving it to God. But I want to, I want to ask you personally, and it's something that I've never done before, it's the first time, but I have to be obedient to God. I don't want anything. The Lord will look after me when I give, but I want you to put something together for your pastors, to bless Bruce and Anya. I want you to be their spotters today. I want you to help them to accomplish what they need to. And you know what? As people in a church, when you give to your pastors, it takes such a burden off of them. Always worrying, will we have enough? Will we this? When there's more than enough money in the bank account, you feel like, okay, yeah, let's do this, let's do that. You've, you've got so much confidence. And I know we don't trust in money, we trust in God. But man, it just helps a lot if you have something in the bank, you know. I'm just being brutally honest with you today. So I want you to put something together today for your pastors. We're going to put the buckets in front. And then to save up time, when you have, when you have given, and I thought different ways you can give. Different ways, EFT and in front. Okay, different ways you can give. Uh, but then when you come to the front, take a cup um, and take a piece of bread. And we all know what it's all about. We all know we've been in church for a long time. Many of us, if you are new, sit with some of the leaders. They will help you. But then just go back to your seat. Sit with your family. Say, thank you, Lord, for your blood. Thank you for your body. Thank you that today my heart is healed. Amen. So today when I ask, are you okay? You must say, yes. So let me close the service and let's bless the seed. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you so much for sticking it out. I know it's quarter past 11. I took some time, but I'm only here once a year, <laughs> you know, but I'm thankful. I hope you were blessed and I hope you received something today, but let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you that we can bless everyone today. Lord, I pray that you will bless us so that we can be a blessing, but thank you that right now we can bless our pastors and be a blessing towards them so that they can be looked after. I pray that they will get such a good offering today that they won't have to worry the whole year. They will have more than enough. That's my prayer. We bless them today. And we thank you that the seed is falling into fruitful soil. And Lord, I thank you that your grace and your mercy will follow us wherever we go when we head out of this building. I thank you that today we are looking after our hearts. We will protect our hearts. And Lord, I want to thank you that you have revived some of the hearts today that haven't been beating the way they were supposed to. Let us focus once again on what's important. Let us look away from all that distract unto Jesus, because that heals our hearts. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.